Hello, I'm Dr. Ira Nash. Welcome to Well Said. Today, we'll be discussing macular degeneration, the leading cause of legal blindness in Americans over the age of 60, with some estimates suggesting that over 18 million Americans may currently suffer from macular degeneration. Thankfully, there are physicians and researchers ready to help treat those suffering from this condition. To learn more about this, I've, I'm delighted to welcome my guest, Dr. Talia Caden. She's an assistant professor of ophthalmology at the Zerker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, and she also serves as the director of the Retina Fellowship at Northwell Health. Talia, welcome to Well Said. Thank you so much for having me. So, how are you doing? I'm great. Glad to be here today. Okay, great. So let's start by having you define macular degeneration. How would you describe the disease to one of your patients? Sure. So I think uh, when you think about the name, it can be a little confusing. What What is a degeneration? What is the macula? And so I always try to tell people that the macula is really a region of the retina, which is the part of the back of the eye that allows you to see. And it's the central region. And when we talk about macular degeneration, what we really mean is something that's more commonly described as age-related macular degeneration. So as you mentioned, it's something we see in generally in older people, um, although it can happen with people in their 50s, but mostly in patients over the age of 60 or 65. And what, what happens is that there are some abnormal changes in the back of the eye. And when we think about it, we think about it in kind of two different categories. And so Historically, these were a dry, or now we describe it as a non-neovascular, meaning no new blood vessels, or a wet form, and that's where there are new blood vessels. And in the dry form, which is the more common form, people may not notice any changes, although as the disease develops and if it becomes much more advanced, there can be changes in central vision. In the wet form, you have abnormal blood vessels that form in that back part of the eye, and those can really impact your vision. So you mentioned central vision a couple of times. Could you just explain what that is relative to just kind of seeing in general? Absolutely. So when you're looking at somebody's face, for example, you know, you're seeing their face, but you're also seeing the things that are going on around you, and that's the peripheral vision. When you're driving a car, you're looking at the car in front of you, but you also Hopefully. have this... I hope, that's right. <laughs> but you also should have a sense of whether or not there's a car moving near you or if a bike is coming right up against you. And so when I talk about central vision, I'm talking about what is right in front of you, what you're focusing on, so what you're reading or the face you're looking at. And in, uh, do our eyes work differently in terms of uh, what allows us to focus on what's in front of us versus what's in our peripheral view? Well, they don't work differently, but the composition is slightly different. So you may remember from you know middle school when we talk about rods and cones. Those are the different types of cells that help people to see. And in the center of the vision, you can remember the C for cone, um, there are more cones. While in the peripheral vision, so the, the part of the, of the eye that's not quite in the center, there are more rods. And those can be helpful for night vision as opposed to in the center where you're really getting that fine, sharp vision. And so uh, in the condition that we're talking about, it affects mostly the central vision. Correct. So what are the typical symptoms that people might start to experience that would lead them to seek uh, attention or, or maybe not even know? Uh, right. Yeah. So that's a great question. What we generally try to tell people is that if they're starting to notice that things are getting distorted, so a good example are straight lines that start to look wavy. I often tell my patients if they're looking at their bathroom tile and the lines don't seem straight or you're looking at a flagpole outside your window mm. and that doesn't seem straight anymore, that's a really important symptom or signal and a reason to come in and be seen. And the same is true if you take care of somebody and they're starting to say, you know, things don't look straight or they look a little bit wavy or distorted. Those are important uh, symptoms you want to pay attention to. And uh, I mentioned in the intro that this is generally progressive. Is, is that always the case? Um, the answer is a little bit of yes and a little bit of no. I think for many patients they can have that dry form or the non-neovascular form for decades and not really have a sense of that there's anything changing. There probably are changes that are occurring on a very small level but for your own kind of lived experience you may not notice it. However the general rule of thumb is that it will continue to evolve as I said, for most patients, they'll continue to maintain very good vision, but for some patients, that, that can change, and it can change abruptly. So there can be a pretty sudden change in vision, and those are moments where you really want to come in and see your eye doctor. And when you say abrupt, like 
one day to the next? Correct. So, you know, particularly in a situation where you have the wet form or the neovascular form, if there is an abnormal blood vessel and it bleeds, you can have a sudden abrupt change or loss of vision. And that would be something very important to, to come in and be seen about. And is this usually uh, symmetrical, meaning affecting both eyes equally? So the answer is, is it's usually impacting both eyes, but it's not symmetric. It's asymmetric. So for most patients, I'll see that they have disease in both eyes, but one eye is usually worse than the other. And is that something that patients would generally notice, or we tend to kind of compensate for that? So amazingly, most people will compensate. Sometimes the difference between the two eyes is pretty subtle, but sometimes it's more significant. And thankfully, you know, we have two eyes, and we can do pretty well with just one eye. So a lot of times, people can have pretty limited vision and not realize it until, you know, something flies into the good eye, they close it, and all of a sudden they realize that the, quote, oh, wow. other eye is the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, it, do we know what causes this? A number of things. It's mostly genetic and age, but there are some things that we can do something about. So, you know, certainly it's more common in patients who are overweight or obese. It's more common in smokers. It's more common in people who have high blood pressure. And it's actually also more common in women. But the biggest risk factor is really age. Um, I'm really, I guess it doesn't surprise me that high blood pressure mm -hmm. would lead to this because that has a whole host of effects on on blood vessels, mm -hmm. none of which are good. Right. Um, but um, I'm really surprised that you said obesity. I, is that understood, what the connection is there? Not really well understood. As a disease, it's also, you know, we use the term macular degeneration as if it's a single disease. But the truth is, is that there are probably variations. And we know about some of the variations in terms of, you know, as a clinician, when I look at somebody's scans in their eye, I have a sense of whether or not, you know, new blood vessels are forming at various layers. And clinically, we will describe that in different terms. And we know that those different types can respond um, in different ways to, d to the treatments that we have. So the answer is that um, it's not all exactly the same. There's some variation, and um, probably some of them are more impacted by things like weight or smoking, but generally we know that there's an association with um, if you're obese or if you have high blood pressure, um, certainly if you're a smoker in both disease occurrence and also disease progression. And what about the, uh, the prevalence in, in women? Is that understood? As far as I know, no. Huh. And how, how disparate are the numbers in men and women? Not tremendously, and it also may be some kind of um, treatment bias where we may see more women in, in our offices than we're seeing men, but um, those are kind of the general thoughts. Now, you mentioned that this is uh, becomes much more common as, as people get older, which prompts, uh, I guess, two questions. One is, uh, how unusual is it in, in younger people, and um, is there some element of I guess I want to say normal aging that is playing a role here? So I think the first question of, you know, how common is it in young people? The answer is this, you know, when we talk about kind of the general macular degeneration or age-related macular degeneration, you should not really be seeing that in a 30-year-old. That being said, you can see other diseases that are similar or that are a version of this in a, in a young person, but you would... Um, you would want to follow them in a different way, um, and you would want to counsel them differently. It is a slightly different type of the disease. In terms of whether or not this is kind of, quote, normal aging, and we're just picking it up, I, I think the answer is probably a little bit of yes, in the same way that it's normal aging to have, you know, blocked blood vessels, but we, we still don't well, want to. Well, I'm not sure I believe that, right? right. So that, I mean, <laughs> yeah. so that, that's, that's really the basis of the question, right? We, right. We, we talk about this all the time in terms of cardiovascular disease, right. which is also obviously much more prevalent as people get older, but I'm always reticent to say it's just aging. normal because there are people who are quite elderly who, who don't get this. So I think maybe a difference between those and something that makes it not a great example is probably there are um, real like habits that you can avoid or um, alter or modify that can help with things like cardiovascular disease. When it comes to macular degeneration, we know there are things that can be helpful. You know, we talk about avoiding cigarette smoke. We talk about eating green leafy vegetables. But, but I think you cannot look at someone with macular degeneration and say, like, this is 
this is because of the way you were living your life for the first 60 years. That would be the wrong message to to come away with. Um, So in that in that extent, I don't think they're good examples. But I do think um, this is something that we see commonly. It's not in everybody. There are, you know, if we say there's about, you know, you said 18, I usually use the number 20 million Americans who have macular degeneration. That's still many, many millions of Americans who don't. Who don't. Uh, who are in the same age Right, who are category. in the same age bracket. And now maybe they're just not being picked up, but I think the likelihood is is they don't. I mean, I have lots and lots of patients I take care of who do not have macular degeneration. So it's not that everybody will age into this. There is definitely a hereditary component. So if you have family members who've had this, you should be getting checked regularly, but um, not everybody will get macular degeneration. I'm also intrigued by what you said about green leafy vegetables. So say, say more about whatever there is to say about the dietary connection here. I think a lot of these are are soft recommendations, and and I don't mean that as to say that you shouldn't do it. I think we know that things that are beneficial for your body are beneficial for your eyes. I think we we know, as I said, you know, we talked about the obesity thing. We talked about cigarette smoking is problematic. Um, I think the thought is that these are, um, have an antioxidant effect that may be beneficial, but I think it's a lot of the time it's we don't have that many great recommendations in order to help, and that's something that seems to be associated with it, so we go with it. I, I don't know that um, I would want anyone listening to come away with the notion that if, if they're eating kale every day, they'll never get macular degeneration. I don't. I would not want to be on the okay. record for that. All right. Fair enough. So so all those jokes about rabbits not eating, needing glasses. Right. Yeah. Not, the not carrots so can only take you so far. Okay. All right. Um, so... Um, uh, as a as an ophthalmologist specializing mm-hmm. in in this condition, uh, what do you do uh, to evaluate somebody if they come to you and say, "Hey, you know, the flagpole looks crooked," or the mm-hmm. uh, I, I'm, I feel like I'm not seeing as clearly as I used to. Sure. So it, for me, so as you said, I'm a specialist in the retina in the back part of the eye, and so for me, all of the patients that I see for a primary exam get kind of a baseline vision. They get a dilated exam so that I can actually look at the back of the eye. And by dilated exam, you mean? Drops that go into the eye to make the pupils larger, which allows me to look at the back part of the eye with special lenses. So it just gives you a bigger Gives me a bigger, through. better view. Correct. Okay. Exactly. A, a, bi- a bigger, like a peephole in a, in a uh, camera. Okay. And then I also do a special kind of test, um, which allows me to look at the layers of the retina. And this test, which is called an OCT, is a very, very helpful tool that I use to evaluate my patients, not only for diseases like macular degeneration, but also for diseases like diabetic retinopathy. Um, you know, it's, it's super helpful, and it's a very important tool. So anyone who's coming in for an evaluation with me will have all of those those elements of their exam. And how is that other test done? You said an OCT? It's, mm-hmm, it's just a camera. So it's a camera. The patient will come in. You'll sit down at the camera. A technician or a photographer will just take a picture, and it gives me line scans looking at all of the layers of the retina within the macula. Wow. And h- how does it do that? Uh, it's, it's a sort of a form. Of, it's, so it's non-invasive. Uh-huh. Um, so it is like a camera, but it actually uses a technology sort of similar to an ultrasound. Um, and it, um, based on the reflectivity of the various layers, gives us uh, that data. And from the patient's perspective, doesn't hurt? And doesn't hurt. You kind of look, it, often um, you'll see either a blue or a red line, and that line kind of progresses down in your vision. And how long does that take to do? Mm, if you do the scan that I do, maybe 10 seconds. Oh, wow. So yes, not long. Not, not a uh, No, not, not a major a investment. For, okay, Mm-mm. great. And uh, so um, you talked about, two different kinds of macular degeneration, the mm-hmm. dry and the wet. Um, do those have different uh, prognoses and, and different treatments? And maybe we should take those one at a time. Yeah, sure. So um, the more common one is what is kind of colloquially described as the dry um, and what we technically call, again, the non-neovascular, so no, no new blood vessels. And that uh, ranges from anything from early what we call early dry macular degeneration, which is something that's often totally asymptomatic for the patient. So they will not know that they have anything. So you just detected that because you were doing an examination for another reason. Yeah, a lot of the time they're sent to me by, let's say, a cataract surgeon who's planning to do cataract surgery, does a scan of the back of the eye or looks in and says, you know, that looks kind of funny. I'm going to send you for an evaluation before your surgery. They come to see me, we take a look, and then I send them back for their cataract surgery. So 
for those patients, there's really nothing that needs to be done. I kind of counsel, again, about the green leafy vegetables, the avoiding the cigarette, all the, all the good healthy things. Yeah. Um, but that, that's not really impacting their vision. And then that can, though, progress. And so the more advanced and kind of the most advanced form of that dry macular degeneration is something called geographic atrophy. And what happens in that is that the cells, those cells we talked about earlier, the rods and the cones, the photoreceptors, those photoreceptors can actually become lost. And so you have atrophy or the loss of those cells. And that leaves people with really pretty limited central vision. So the ability to look at faces or to read can be impacted by that. Now, historically, we had no treatment for geographic atrophy. But that actually changed a few weeks ago. A few weeks ago? Yeah, I think in mid-February. Okay, more timely than I thought. There you go. This is very new. Um, there's a new actual treatment, an injected medication into the eye um, that was approved by the FDA in order to help uh, slow the rate of progression of geographic atrophy. And that's kind of an important distinction. What, what that means is we can't grow those cells back. Can't make it better, we but you can stop it from getting worse as fast. Correct. Okay. So what I always I try to tell my patients is that, right, I can't make it better. I can't stop it in its tracks. But if you imagine kind of the rate of progression as kind of a slope or a line on a graph, we can drop it down by somewhere around 20-ish, 20, 20 20 to 30 percent over two years yeah. in, the, in the studies we've seen. And so I actually did my first injection of that medication a few weeks ago for a patient who has lost central vision in one eye and has this, these areas of atrophy kind of right around her central vision in the other eye. And so she was very interested in this treatment because for her, she knows what it is to lose that central vision. Sure. And if she can kind of prolong the period of time in which she maintains good vision in one eye, that's worth you know, having these, these treatments done. So that's all for the dry. So correct. So that's okay. kind of just the one arm. Now, right. The other arm is the wet form. And this is the one where, you know, if, if anybody's ever heard of someone who's getting lots of injections in the eye, that's usually, and before it was only, um, because they had the wet or neovascular form. And these medications basically help to seal up those abnormal blood vessels and try to keep them from leaking and bleeding, more importantly. And uh, I know people have, have probably heard about laser treatments for a variety of retinal illnesses or, or conditions, does that have any role here? No. So um, laser surgery, which is a pretty, you know, lasers, as you know, can be used for all sorts sure. of things. And sometimes people come in asking about lasers for the front of the eye, which can help with, you know, your vision, like getting new glasses. We use lasers a fair amount in patients who have problems in the back of the eye from diabetes. But uh, for macular degeneration, there's really no role for laser treatment. Historically, before we had injected medications, people tried that. And um, the data was not particularly compelling. And so as soon as we got better alternatives, people stopped using lasers. All right. So I want to go back to these injections, right? Sure. Because I, I got to say, uh, the thought of having somebody it's inject like something yeah. into my eyeball is just horrifying. <laughs> and, and so um, I imagine a lot of people just cringe at the thought of this. So walk us through what that actually feels like for a patient. Sure. So I think, first of all, you are not alone in having that reaction. Um, most people, when I tell them that that's what the recommended treatment is, are really quite fearful. But um, after some discussion, and certainly after they've gone through the process, I think they feel much more reassured. So the first thing to remember is it's a very, very tiny needle. This is not a big, scary thing coming at your eye. It's a tiny, tiny, very small. We use a 30-gauge needle, which is really, really quite small. Um, the second thing is that we numb the eye. So we give lots of drops in order to make sure that you're feeling comfortable. And, you know, I often, I tell my patients as I walk them through it, it takes me longer to explain what I'm going to yeah. do than it does to do it. So the procedure really takes, you know, less than 30 seconds. But it that thought of like seeing this coming you at you, right? You don't see it coming at you. So I'm very careful, first <laughs> of all. I do not show them the needle or the syringe. It doesn't, you don't see it coming at you. And it, it's really so small. It comes at the, it goes through the white of the eye, which is called the sclera, and it goes into the back, the you know, the cavity in the back of the eye near the retina. And, and say a little bit more about what it is you're injecting and what it does. Sure. So the first medication... That, that people really started using, or one version of them, is Avastin, which is a medication that is used, um, it was in, 
it is and was a um, cancer therapeutic drug, and it's called an antivascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF medication. And what that does is it helps um, essentially these abnormal blood vessels, they're not formed normally, and as a result, they leak a lot. And this medication can kind of help those little blood vessels from being so leaky. So for you know, the about 15 plus years, um, all of the medications we had were kind of a version of that. Um, they were, there are different forms and they're all really exceptionally effective, um, exceptionally safe. I mean, we've had many, many drugs that have come through and they're really, almost all of them are excellent. Um, more recently, about a year ago, a new medication was released that's actually a combination therapy. Um, so it's the first one that has two different um, mechanisms of action. So it functions in two different ways, and it actually inhibits another molecule called ANG2, um, and that's also been proven to be very effective. So now we have a great kind of repertoire of options for our patients. And when you say effective, is that effective in the sense of slowing progression or actually improving the, the condition? Yeah, so that's a great question. In this case, it actually can improve vision. Um, so rather than, you know, the first injection we talked about, which was really just to halt the progression of the atrophy, for the wet form, these injections actually can improve vision and, and sometimes very significantly. So, you know, patients can come in with vision where they're, you know, they're no longer seeing well on the chart at all. And after a few treatments with these medications, they can go back to seeing, you know, driving distance vision. Oh, that's great. And is this the kind of thing that uh, requires constant maintenance uh, therapy? Yes. Yeah, so this is not, as I say, it's not a one and done. I don't get to treat and then we're and then we're done forever. I often tell my patients it's a lot more like taking blood pressure medication. It's a maintenance therapy that we will likely need, but we do, and I try very hard to kind of tailor the treatment to my patients, to each specific person, and and to make sure I'm not treating them more than necessary. So um, I do what's called a treat and extend protocol, which means essentially that sometimes I do one injection every month. Sometimes we go for one month and then extend from there. But I'm always trying to see how long I can go between injections while obviously maintaining good, good vision and, and making sure we're being safe. But I guess roughly speaking, people would expect to have multiple injections over the course of a year. Correct. And sometimes that can be as often as once every month, which is 12 injections a year. Um, now, some of the newer medications are approved for once every four months. And so that, you know, is only three injections a year. Which is yeah. So that, that I guess that brings me to my next question. You mentioned a little bit about um, this new medication. What other advances are there in the field that you're excited about that that improve your ability to make people see better? Sure. So there was actually another um, big moment was when there was something called the port delivery system, which was a, um, a way of creating kind of a depot of the drug that would sit in the eye. So something actually had to be implanted in the operating room, but then that could be filled in the eye. Unfortunately, they had to put a pause on that because there was sort of a mechanism issue with it. So that's no longer available. But I think in the next few years, something like that will be more of the future because it's a lot to ask of people. I mean, especially if we're talking about people who are still working age, they still want to be kind of out and about doing, living their lives. And to ask someone to come in even three, four times a year, but certainly 12 times a year to our office to be seen and to get these injections, it's a lot. And so I think uh, longer acting medications, our, our medications are very effective. Yeah. That's not our issue. They're great drugs. Um, I think the things that certainly I think a lot of retina specialists hope for is that we'll have uh, medications that can last even longer. And there are some new drugs coming down the pipeline that hopefully will get more durability, so these longer acting elements, or new uh, treatment modalities, so something like an implanted device or um, kind of a depot that sits there would be great. Any work on uh, medications that can be um Taken by Taken mouth. orally, yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, I'm still horrified about the, You're, the You still the are scared of the needle. Um, <laughs> I think the answer is always yes. Everyone would prefer, you know, doctors and patients alike. Um, we would love it if we did not have to stick needles in people's eyes in order to help them. Because even though the risk is small, there is always a risk of infection when we do this kind sure. of thing. And so um, we we want to minimize that. So the answer is yes, but n not in the next you know, not not today, not tomorrow. Yeah, so not not imminent. Not imminent. Hopefully, at some point. Yeah. Um, well, this has been really uh, interesting, and I, I thank you so much for for educating me and our listeners about this. 
where would you recommend people go to get more information if they have macular degeneration or they're just more interested in the in the subject? Sure. So I think the two best resources are probably the American Academy of Ophthalmology, which the website is aao.org, or the American Society of Retina Specialists, which is asrs.org. And both of those are great resources for people who want to learn more about the disease. It's good if you're a patient. It's good if you're a family member. Um, and they have really wonderful resources. And um, the ASRS actually also has a um, an inventory of all of the doctors, you know, all the retina specialists. So if you're looking for a retina specialist in your area, you can use that to help find somebody. Actually, you know, we didn't talk about that much, but, but this is not something that your run-of-the-mill ophthalmologist is likely to be helpful with. Is that correct? Correct. So generally, um, these kind of injections and this treatment should really be done by somebody who's a trained retina specialist. And and is there some certification or fellowship training that people should be aware of? Yes. Yeah, so you should look for somebody who's either done a one-year fellowship in medical retina or a two-year fellowship in both medical and surgical retina. Okay. Well, great. Thanks again. Uh, my guest has been Dr. Talia Caden. She is an assistant professor of ophthalmology at the Zucker School of Medicine and the director of the Retina Fellowship at Northwell Health. Thanks also to Jared Bassman for researching this topic, to our producer, Connor Pilkington, and our audio engineer, John Muller. For more information about this program and to find past episodes, please visit medicine.hofstra.edu slash well said. You can also subscribe to our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Our listeners are welcome to send comments, suggestions, and questions to wellsaid at hofstra.edu. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ira Nash, and that's Well Said. Well said.